Hi everyone, good afternoon. Let everyone take their seats. <laughs> so left. My name's Catherine Doyle and I'm the Director of Science Research and Advocacy with the Performing Animal Welfare Society and I'm so pleased to be here and thank you to Ron and Stephanie. And actually I did want to comment though um, because I've been to these events in the past and I'm so thrilled to see the room full because that's what we always wanted. <laughs> So thank every, you know, just thank you everyone for coming. So um, the subject is, of this panel is the role for zoos and aquariums in animal welfare advocacy. Advocacy can take on different forms, such as working to create change for animals in the wild through legislation, as we've seen with statewide prohibitions on the sale of ivory and rhino horn. It could also mean being a voice for captive wild animals in zoos and aquariums by asking hard questions about animal welfare um, advocating for more science, I'm all in favor of that, and um, also for making whatever improvements we can to welfare. So first I'd like to introduce our panelists. Of course you can read more about them in the biographies. Dr. Steven Eisenman is Professor of Art History at Northwestern University in Chicago. Uh, next to him is Delcy Winders. She's an academic fellow at Harvard, sorry, academic, why do I have fellow twice? <laughs> Acad <laughs> academic fellow um, at Harvard University in the Law and Policy Program, sorry, Harvard Law School. Um, let me see, Nicole Paquette is Vice President of Wildlife Protection for the Humane Society of the United States, and Jeff Flock in here is a North America Regional Director for the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And uh, first we're gonna talk about, with the first type of advocacy, working for change for non-human animals outside of zoological facilities. And um, so I'm going to pose the first uh, questions, a couple of questions here to Jeff and to Nicole, um, because they both work with organizations involved in animal welfare policy reform. So um, simple question, probably long answer. <laughs> um, what do you think the role of AZA accredited facilities should be in advancing progressive public policy to protect captive wildlife? Um, I'll go first. Uh, earlier today, Scott from Disney said, and I'm going to try to quote him here, that fundamentally all zoos and aquariums all want to make the world a better place for animals and people. So I saw a lot of nodding in the audience, so hopefully people don't disagree with that statement. But what I think is interesting about that is it's very ambitious. It says he wants to make the world a better place for animals and people. And if you break that down, the world and better, it implies change far beyond your own borders of your zoos and aquariums, really making it a better world. And to do that, it's going to require policy change. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor and scientist like most people here. So when I try to go about changing something, I look to laws and advocacy. And it has a bad rep in much, many parts of the world, but it's the way that things get done. And it's gonna be the only way that we stop the mass problems we have currently with the conservation loss, the loss of biodiversity around the world, as well as inhumane standards for animals. Zoos have a platform. You have 185 million people going through accredited zoos in North America alone every year. You're part of the community. You have a voice as an institution. I've never met an executive director who has not been able to get a meeting with a representative of Congress or even a senator when they come to Washington, D.C. All of us up here would kill for that opportunity to get in front of them and to plead for more money to go to biodiversity conservation, to go towards reforming currently inhumane laws on the state level or the federal level. So you, we know that the public trusts you and the media trusts you. But what we're lacking right now is we don't see that willingness to be advocates. And I'd like to say that the opportunity is there. Even if you're with a municipality that doesn't allow for you to advocate on particular laws, you can work with partners. It takes nothing to say, if you want to learn more to how to help this issue, go talk to WCS or go to the website for World Wildlife Fund or my organization. There are easy ways to do this. Or you can educate about bills without advocating. You can say that this law is going to be voted on. Go home and learn more about it on the internet without actually violating any kind of lobbying laws. I'm going to give an example to start with, and I'm going to pick kind of a controversial one. Um, a couple times people alluded to the fact that the, rapidest, the most rapidly declining large mammal in Africa right now is the giraffe. And it's true, their population has dropped about 40% in the last 30 years, leaving us with about 100,000 individuals left in Africa. They're being killed or dying off due to habitat loss, excessive trade, and poaching for bushmeat. And when you use your education or your conservation mandate and tell people who are visiting most of your zoos that this is the problem, they're not going to be able to stop development in Africa. They're likely not going to be able to stop hunting for bushmeat. But there are opportunities. Just recently, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, along with HSUS, CBD, and NRDC, petitioned the U.S. government to list giraffes as endangered under the U.S. Endangered Species Act. 
The U.S. is a major part of the problem in the trade element that the giraffe is currently facing as a major threat. We did an analysis and found that over a 10-year period that approximately 40,000 giraffe parts were shipped into the United States as part of trade. That includes specimens, live trade, but 4,000 different trophies of stuffed giraffes, giraffes that were killed for sport. Now, I realize when you get into trophy hunting, people are like, whoa, whoa, that can be good conservation, or that might really upset some of my donors. So I'd like to go back to the compassionate conservation graph that we talked about earlier, where you can look at what's being, whether or not it's compassionate conservation by, is it good or bad for the species? Is it good or bad for the individual? And whether or not you buy the arguments for or against trophy hunting that it can help the species, that it's necessary, that there is or isn't alternative non-lethal ways to work with these populations, you can certainly say that for the individual, it's shit. Um, it's not a good way to go forward in saving animals and animal welfare. So your people who come to your zoo love the individual animals. They see them. They fall in love with them. They want to help individuals. They want to help species. You can tell them to weigh in on the national public comment if you're in the United States and to be part of the, the crowds that we need to really advocate for more protections for these animals. If we're successful, the, and, and giraffes are listed as endangered in the U.S. Endangered Species Act, there will be no more trophies coming to the U.S. without a very strict permitting system at the very least. Right now, you don't have to do anything to bring in a trophy. You just have to go through the USDA process. And we'd like to see a control on that because we know giraffes are dying in the wild. Zoos can play a part. And that's just one of many different ways that you could activate your own members. And as a zoo, you could speak out to decision makers to try to make these things happen. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ron and Stephanie, for having me. Um, just to kind of echo what Jeff is saying um, and also what Wayne just uh, previously said, that obviously one of the most important roles that zoos can play is advocacy. And working on advancing public policy should be more of a central role for zoos across the country. Now, I've been working on state legislation and federal legislation uh, across the board on a range of issues for about 20 years. And, and Wayne had rightfully pointed out some zoos that have helped um, in passage of individual bills. But so much more needs to be done. And I'll give you one example. So the, on the exotic pet trade. So a lot of folks think that obviously it's, it's, a, it's illegal to own a tiger as a pet. But actually only 34 states ban the private possession of tigers as pets. And then if you go down to looking at more of the dangerous animals, so big cats, bears, primates, wolves, and some of the reptiles, only 21 states have a full ban on the keeping of those animals. And then it's a patchwork even within those. Some regulate roadside zoos, some only regulate the pet trade. And so what we've been doing at HSUS with coalition partners, we've been trying to kind of check off the box and and prohibit the private possession of all five categories. And we need your help to do it. We, we go into these offices and they don't necessarily want to hear from us, they want to hear from the experts. And those experts are actually all of you guys in the room. And you're the one who are leaders in your communities and in your states. And so we would urge you to work with us. Uh, we do reach out to you quite often. And Texas is a perfect example. We are trying to ban um, the keeping of these animals, and we were trying to get a hearing, and they wouldn't push put it on the agenda for us until we got the endorsement of uh, the zoo community. So we were able to garner four zoos in Texas, as well as the AZA, and that actually put us over the map, and we were held a hearing, and it just passed out unanimously. But again, it shows how critical that we can't do this alone, and that when we actually shouldn't be pushing this. Um, alone. It should be an, a partnership. And then just a few other issues that would be great uh, for assistance. Every year we see bills being introduced on the shark finning trade. We've got around, I think, 11 or 12 states that ban the sale of shark fins. Again, that's an issue that is perfect for the zoo community to partner with the animal protection community. Um, and uh, it's a win-win for everybody. Also, wildlife trafficking, I think there's about five to six states that are banning certain species of the trade. Again, we need your help with those efforts, and obviously the Oregon Zoo helped tremendously for the ballot measure, and Woodland Park Zoo on the Washington effort. 
But again, these, these bills are not gonna get done just by the animal protection community. It really needs the zoo community. But there are also issues that, uh, some of the issues that we, sh that the zoos actually should be taking a greater role in. And one of those is um, tr trying to prohibit some of the wild animal acts in uh, circuses and traveling shows. I mean, this is a, an issue that it's been controversial for the zoo community, and not everyone has taken a strong stand. And Wayne pointed out that uh, last year in um, California, they banned bull hooks across the board uh, on elephants, and the zoo community actually led that charge. But that wasn't the same case when we passed a, a, a law in another state. We actually had the zoo community in opposition to that bill, and um, it's just an area that we should all come together on and try to end that horrific practice. I mean, elephants and tigers should not be traveling around in circuses across the country. And I think it's a perfect example of where we can partner on something to finally put an end to a very outdated practice. And then I'll, one more I would recommend too is, um, is trophy hunting. I mean, this is an, a perfect example as well Many of the zoos actually display these animals that are being killed solely for a trophy, not only in Africa, but right here in the US. And I think Cecil really shined a spotlight on, the, on this practice. And so many people had no idea that these animals were actually being killed right here, um, right here in, in, the, in the states where they're uh, native to. So mountain lions are being killed, bobcats are being killed, bears and wolves. And it's so important for the zoo community to stand up against us. You're displaying these animals and uh, people should not be just needlessly killing them solely for a trophy. So we would love to work with you and partner with you on these efforts. Um, and so we're, um, if you're interested in doing more, we've got lots of bills in play and we would uh, love to work with you. Uh, another question, actually I think for, oh, pause. <laughs> With you. <laughs> um, so um, actually, too, in the last couple of panels, um, there was, I kept hearing the phrase accredited facility or accredited zoo. And I think in this day and age, it's important to say who's accrediting you because there are now other accrediting and certification organizations. And it is having an effect on um, animal welfare policy. So, uh, Nicole, can you touch on that? Oh, sure. And, whoever, and actually, Delcy or whoever else wants to weigh in. Um, so I'm sure. I think a little bit has been touched upon the different accreditations uh, associations out there. And this, the, this by now there are three, so it's the Zoological Association, Association of Zoos and Aquariums, as, as well as American Humane. And this, from a policy perspective, this really does um, muddy the water in terms of who is accredited, what does that really mean? And I think the key, we haven't seen much play with the AHA, at least at the policy level. To date, at least I haven't. But what, where we have seen is with the ZAA. And it has caused so many problems in passing bills. In fact, many, I think in Illinois, they came in to try to um, amend our bill, and we ended up killing a very progressive bill that actually would have regulated roadside zoos. And so I think, to, I think this is one area where the zoo community and the animal protection community should really come together on again, because we, I'm out there at the state house trying to say between the, uh, distinguish between ZAA and AZA, but lawmakers don't actually know the difference. And you know, a, one lawmaker could go to a, a roadside zoo and they would, could say, wow, this is a great facility. This is a tiny business bringing, uh, allowing to, local children to come see the animals. Uh, I don't want to be putting out, a biz I don't want to put this individual out of business. And they see nothing wrong with that facility. Um, and so they're not distinguishing anything between, uh, and they're accredited. So what's the difference between an acc accredited facility? Um, the other problem is, is that there's dual AZA, there's zoos that are AZA accredited and also ZAA accredited. So there's about six to seven of those, and that really hurts the efforts when you're trying to distinguish between standards of care. And so, um, and I think the point to raise also is that uh, there are very easy w uh, distinguishing markers from AZA and ZAA, obviously, and one of them is ZAA supports the cub petting trade. And I think that is something where 
AZA has, in fact, taken a strong stand on. I think there are some species within the categories um, that we disagree on, but that, that's an area where the animal protection community can come together, come up with a list, and say we should be against this horrible practice because the cub petting trade adds thousands of animals into the exotic pet trade. And if we stop that just alone, we could be doing such a great service to the captive wildlife out in the U.S. So. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the cub petting trade, we're talking about speed breeding these cubs for a four-week period where they're legally allowed to be handled for photographs, and then you end up with a surplus that have to be disposed of afterwards. I don't know if many of you remember in 2009 where they found almost 100 cubs that had been killed and buried in a backyard of tigers, Tiger Rescue USA um, that were part of the speed breeding process. And then, and then you want to say something, but I have one more comment. Um, and so what has organic today. <laughs> so what has resulted, though, when we have introduced these uh, bills? So essentially, we've been introducing bills to ban exotic pet ownership, and we list the AZA as an exempted party, so they don't have to follow the restrictions of the law. And so ZAA comes in and tries to become exempted. So we feel that that's a, a big loophole because they accreditate roadside zoos, but they also endorse uh, private ownership, um, and they also obviously endorse cub petting. So we have had to completely modify our pieces of legislation that um, just in order to not have ZAA in the mix. And just to give you a number, I, was, I looked this up right before it, was since ZAA came active in the legislative process, only four uh, bills have actually passed uh, banning exotic pet ownership. Um, and so they have s significantly slowed the progress down of passing these bills. And they've also um, essentially pr made us change the exemptions to a USDA exemption with qualifications. And in many of these states, we are not capturing roadside zoos. And so it is a shame that we are left with that. But I think, again, this is one area where we should be working together because currently with ZAA out there, roadside zoos, there's nothing being really done at the policy level to address some of the problems. I just, I want to underscore that, and Scott Carter mentioned earlier that he uses the phrase deliberately accredited zoos to distinguish what we're talking about, but as Nicole indicated, that term is becoming diluted and almost meaningless because we have these so-called accrediting programs with vacuous standards, and I think it's not just an issue for those of us who are out doing advocacy, it's an issue for the AZA, it's an issue for every AZA facility because it's undermining your brand and what all the work you've done to distinguish yourself from the so-called bad zoos. And so I, th I, would, I would love to see the AZA not only helping with these advocacy efforts, but just doing more work out there to defend the brand and to distinguish itself from these other so-called accrediting bodies. And in many instances, what I've seen, it's the animal protection groups who are left to explain the differences between AZA and ZAA. And I'd love to see you helping with do more of that work. And I think Nicole mentioned that there are a handful of facilities that are both AZA and ZAA, and some of them are also so-called AHA human conservation certified now as well. And I think that's especially concerning because that's lending legitimacy to these programs that really lack rigorous standards. Okay, good, very good. Back to the good zoo, bad zoo um, problem there. Um, question for Delcy. So um, how can zoological facilities act as advocates for animal welfare by interfacing with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, for example, um, the zoological com can uh, the zoological community help address the deletion of thousands of animal welfare records uh, that were deleted from the USDA website, or even the agency's failure to effectively enforce the Animal Welfare Act? Yes, please. Um, just a little background, especially for the international delegates. So for more than a decade, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which regulates zoos, other exhibitors, other industries that use animals, has posted its inspection reports for these facilities online. And it has expressly acknowledged that the Freedom of Information Act's affirmative disclosure mandates require it to do that. And despite having recognized that, having posted these records for so long, as many of you no doubt know, on February 3rd, with virtually no warning, the agency took that website down. And that was especially concerning because the agency, as my own research focuses on, and the USDA's own offer, 
Office of Inspector General has said over and over again in audit reports, the agency is failing to meaningfully enforce the Animal Welfare Act. So access to these records about how it was regulating or failing to regulate were allowing us, all of us in the room, really, to hold the agency accountable, to keep an eye on what the substandard facilities were doing, maybe to step in where, where the USDA was failing to do its job, and, and our ability to do that became, was taken away. And um, I was very happy to see that the AZA wasted no time in coming out with a strong statement questioning, di registering its disagreement with this move. So the move happened on a Friday. The following Monday, Dan Ash um, came out with a statement noting that these records are essential for ensuring the public's trust and confidence in the records that these, in, in, the, in the facilities, that these are essentially zoos licensed to operate, and they're what allow the public to distinguish between good and bad zoos. But what has happened since then is really concerning. So the USDA has posted some records back. And I think all AZA zoo inspections are now available online. What's not available are the smaller facilities, the privately owned, individually owned facilities, facilities that have some of the worst records of violations. Those are still not online. And I think we could really use, I'm involved in litigation challenging that, but there's also legislation trying to address it. There's a, a range of efforts, and I think we could really use continued AZA and AZA member institution support to, uh, to help push for all of the records to be restored. And one of the things that's happening is that legislation has been introduced in Congress to, to require all the the records to be uh, reposted and there's a, a briefing on Capitol Hill next month and my understanding is that AZA has declined not only to support the legislation but even to part was invited to participate in the briefing and declined to participate in the briefing so I hope that the organization and the individual member institutions will consider being more vocal about, about this specific disclosure issue, but then moving forward about the ongoing enforcement problems that are allowing substandard zoos to, to continue doing business as usual and failing to incentivize them to come into compliance with even the minimum standards of the Animal Welfare Act. Um, and Delcia, this one's for you as well. So, of course, you know, um, animals move between zoos and not all animals born in zoos are gonna stay there. Um, so what is the role of um, AZA accredited zoos in ensuring the welfare of animals uh, through transfer policies? Yeah, so we've heard many, many references to Marius over the past couple days, whether we've heard his name explicitly, we've heard him alluded to, and we've heard that, you know, that we can debate whether there's a welfare concern when we're talking about whether you want to call it management euthanasia, culling euthanasia, whatever you call it, we can debate whether there's a welfare concern. There's no question whatsoever that there's an animal welfare concern when we're talking about transferring animals and where those animals are going. And I think there's a lot more that zoos can be doing. And I think it's something that's sort of been swept under the rug and would cause a uh, a lot of public concern if the public were aware of some of where some of the animals are going. So I know the, the AZA policy on responsible population management says that zoos, sh quote, should make it a priority when possible to transfer to accredited facilities. I don't think that's strong enough. And I've seen records of many animals, especially very young hoofstock, who are being sent to dealers who have no affiliation with the AZA and who do have affiliations with canned hunt facilities. So Nicole mentioned that trophy hunting is happening here in the US um, and trophy hunting is happening on the watch of dealers who are acquiring animals from AZA facilities. So I think there's a lot more work that can be done there. Okay, Stephen, we're moving to you now. You have a card asking that we get to you. Um, you present a very different perspective. Um, you bring a different perspective to this panel. So can you talk about your experience with your students' visit to a zoo and how that affected their perception of the role of zoos in animal welfare? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm a professor of art history at Northwestern. I've written a couple of books about art and animal rights, and I've also been involved with some uh, activism regarding uh, animal experimentation slash vivisection. But I taught a course on uh, art and animal rights, and I had a group of uh, first-year students in the class, and I thought they should see some animals, obviously, to talk about it. Carl's point was very well taken about Carl Sarafina's point in his talk about how a few uh, students, young people, are able to see animals. So I wanted them to see animals in the Northwestern University Biological Research Laboratories. That was out, because I had already done an investigation of that, and I had spoken about it on the radio, and they didn't want me anywhere near the place, or my students. And then I thought I should take them to uh, a, a, um, uh, a slaughterhouse, where they'd see animals, a feedlot in a slaughterhouse, but they wouldn't grant us access to that. 
And I thought, well, Lincoln Park Zoo is nearby. I would take them to Lincoln Park Zoo. Uh, I live quite near it. So we went to Lincoln Park Zoo, and we had a, a nice uh, meeting with an educator, a young, wo young woman there, very smart woman, very professional. And she told us about the core missions of the zoo, uh, care, conservation, uh, research, care, conservation, research. The fourth is about the same. Education, thank you. Um, and so we started to ask some quite challenging questions after we had a tour uh, of the zoo by ourselves. We had seen, for example, the Kovler Lion House, where we saw a facility built in 1912, where we saw uh, lions pacing back and forth, in which my students, who know nothing about, even less than I do about zoos, uh, could recognize what we call stereotypical behavior. Uh, we saw the uh, Regenstein um, uh, Great Ape uh, facility, a state-of-the-art facility, uh, 30, almost 30,000 square feet, and we saw gorillas and chimpanzees. We saw gorillas, for example, in an enclosure with a glass wall at a high ceiling, something like this room, perhaps, in size. And uh, we saw one gorilla being given a uh, kind of a test or a game with an iPad, where he would uh, be shown the iPad, and he'd touch certain keys, and if he hit the right key, he'd get a treat. And then we had our interview after all that. We had an interview with this um, educator. And my students and I uh, asked uh, about the conservation function of the zoo. And we said, well, how many animals are returned to the wild after being here? And she said, well, it's very difficult to do that. Basically, none. Then we didn't learn that certain frogs and snakes have been returned and bred and returned. But in terms of large animals, which is the reason people go to the zoo generally, uh, none, as far as we knew. I'm sure there are ex exceptions. I think it was a gazelle maybe somewhere in the past had been, but this is fairly widespread. And then we asked about this uh, thing with the lion house, and they said, well, it was a cold day, and so the lions didn't have really want to go to their slightly larger outside area, so they had to stay inside that pen. We do our best to take the animals, to take good care of the animals, and to give them enrichments. And then we asked about the gorilla thing, and uh, they all, the students all felt that it was somewhat demeaning that uh, we're turning uh, gorillas into the same kind of uh, digital robots that we are, having our cell phones in front of us all the time, or that sort of, and is this really the kind of experience that the gorillas and great apes should be experienced to? And they began to challenge whether in fact it was right to keep animals like great apes or lions and tigers in a zoo as good as the Lincoln Park Zoo really is. And again, the educator was thoughtful and, and tried to answer the questions, but these in some ways were unanswerable questions. So I guess the education that the students came away from uh, the Lincoln Park Zoo was not so much about animals out in the wild or animal conservation or preservation or any of that, but it was an education about the nature of zoos. And they, they left with very challenging questions. I did too. So this is in a way a kind of report from the field by a, by a lay person about how students and their non-specials faculty member experience uh, an otherwise, I'm sure, outstanding zoo, the Lincoln Park Zoo. So actually, as a follow-up to that, though, what message should zoos be getting from your experience, and how do you think they can better address your students' concerns? Well, I, I think something that came up has come up frequently in here, and which uh, I'm quite sympathetic to, and my students seem to be in our discussion, that is the idea of zoos as, I know it's become a cliche in the room now, but zoos as sanctuaries. They like the idea that animals, if they have no other place to go, will be in the zoo, they'll be protected. So anytime uh, we would be talking about the great apes, they would say, or other animals, they'd say, well, is it here because they can't be out in the wild? Why don't we return them to the wild? So they've, they felt instinctively, and I guess I do too, that if a zoo is taking care of an animal who's been orphaned and can't go to a larger sanctuary where they can really be out of doors and experience movement in groups, I understand that gorillas need, in the wild, 30 to 50,000, 30,000? No, sorry, 30 to 50 square miles of movement, if they can't be provided anything like that, and a zoo is the only place where they could be protected and live out something like a life uh, of some quality, well then that makes sense to my students and it does to me. So perhaps something about that sanctuary quality, and it may be that that's the way zoos are moving. That may be the direction. I've heard it spoken up several times here. A question I sort of would have for you all, uh, zoo people here, is do you have an eye on, I don't want to make it too dramatic, but on the end game? Like the next step, uh, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, I suspect that zoos can't continue to exist like they do now, where they seem to be entertainment more than education about animals in the wild. That can't continue. Are you really ready to go to that next place, and do you have the steps in, in place to do that? It sounds like there's discussion in this room about that, but 
but whether you all are ready, uh, just it's not it's unclear. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, I have a question for. Question for the panel here. Um, in this one, actually, it's a perfect segue because it's about um, the idea of zoos evolving into a sanctuary model. Now, before I get th to that, I would like to make a quick statement, which is um, there was, uh, I think, a, a phrase, a mention of something about uh, that sanctuary is managed to extinction. And I work for a sanctuary, and what we do is we care for individual animals, provide the best care that we possibly can for them for the entirety of their lives. And to tell the truth, I thought that's what zoos are doing, too. So, um, so I just wanted to make that clarification there. Um, but anyway, so it is increasingly suggested that zoos should evolve into a sanctuary, a sanctuary-like model. So this implies more of a role in animal welfare advocacy. So what type of animal welfare advocacy would be required to qualify for a facility, to qualify, the, excuse me, let me start that again. What type of animal welfare advocacy would be required to qualify a facility um, you know, for them to be at least sanctuary-like. So, for example, should a, uh, the zoological community pledge to dedicate a certain amount of space to take in captive-born rescues, even though these animals cannot be bred and may not be the healthiest or most attractive animals, which, of course, makes them the ones most in need. So, and then also um, the role of the zoological community in helping to stem the rampant breeding of, uh, as we've talked about a little bit, lions, tigers, non-human primates, and bears for roadside zoos. I'll jump in quickly and just say there is an accreditation standard for sanctuaries that is becoming more in vogue, uh, the GFAS standard, G-F-A-S-S. -S. And um, there are certain requirements that sanctuaries need to meet to comply with that, including not breeding. So clearly, Moni Zoos would not be part of that if they're not willing to take the breeding part out of their captive uh, mission. But there are great lessons in the GFAS standards that kind of show how they're there to give the best life possible to the end of life for these animals. And their missions are slightly different than zoos, but I think they are wholly compatible in some ways. So we're looking to see what the best sanctuary they're doing. We've seen some great ones here today, like Grace and some of the other sanctuaries that we talked about, like Paws, um, looking to see how they incorporate having a captive animal collection, but with sanctuary standards. I'll just, I'll jump in. Um, I think one of the easiest uh, ways to maybe even transition into a sanctuary model is when you have those incidences where a exotic pet needs to be rescued or a roadside zoo, zoo is being inspected and uh, the animals need to be confiscated. I think that has traditionally fallen to the sanctuary and animal protection community and law, en law enforcement is left to, to sit there and say, what, what the heck am I going to do? Most of these shelters have no idea how to handle these animals and they reach out to the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries who then oftentimes the animal protection movement jumps in to help um, possibly pay for that transfer or assist in placement. And our biggest concern is we do not want those animals to go to an even worse situation. So we would want them to go to a sanctuary that's accredited or a zoo, accredited zoo. And so one easy way is to really be a greater resource for those um, cruelty cases. And, um, and it, tells, it gives you a great story to tell. I know that several zoos have rescued circus tigers. They've rescued, I think Detroit has rescued a racehorse and uh, tells the story of why these practices are bad. And it, it really allows you to play a greater advocacy role in the, in the effort as well. So I would, I would urge that at the very least, the starting point would be to be looking at assisting the uh, sanctuary community when you get those calls. Actually, we have one minute, right? So, oh, out of time. Look, can I just do one quick question? Real quick, because I do have one card here. So, and I think this is important. Um, do you think that uh, it might be useful or would there be a role for the World Zoo Association in endorsing or supporting zoo accrediting organizations? In other words, or for you know, differentiating between welfare-based accreditation and bad accreditation systems? Yes, I think that would be wonderful. I, don't, I mean, Nicole, you deal with this at the legislative level, so. No, I mean, I think obviously there is a role. I, I think the more, the stronger that an entities bond together to show that they are the highest standards, the easier it's going to be. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know what else to say other than, yeah, I mean, that would be a great idea. So the answer is yes. <laughs> so um, please join me in thanking the panel, and uh, thank you all very much.